Hey you guys, welcome to Book Review 137. Today I am going to be reviewing A Beginner's Guide to Paradise. Nine steps to giving up everything so you can move to a Pacific Island, wear a loincloth, read a hundred books, build a bungalow, baby or diaper a baby monkey, and maybe, just maybe, fall in love. Individual results may vary, baby monkey not included. So as the uh, uh, title would indicate, this is not a book that takes itself too seriously. Uh, oh, by Alex Shisoff. So uh, Alex decides um, after having a marginally successful, uh, though very stressful, um, political uh, activist uh, business in New York, um, he decides to quit all that and move to the South Pacific. Now, a couple words on what he did at this political activist organization. Um, he was essentially uh, tried to use the early tools of the internet uh, in order to um, get people to be more politically active. Uh, I don't think it was partisan, though I'd imagine he probably votes Democrat, but... Um, I, it's more just uh, try to get people involved in local politics, uh, tell them uh, what's going on with their election, you know, whatever, um, through uh, the information, me the new information medium of the internet. Uh, kind of the mantle after he quit his business has been taken on by uh, moveon.org and other, you know, blogs, other things like that. Um, but... Uh, living in New York City, he was working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week uh, in order to uh, keep this business afloat. Um, he was really finding no uh, satisfaction in life. He felt like New York was just kind of too crammed uh, for him. Uh, and that's how a lot of people feel uh, about New York. And some love it and some don't. Uh, I think Alex, uh, uh, while he's happy that he had the experience, was not uh, would not really go back to the lifestyle that he previously had. Um, he also indicated in the book that he was in a relationship that kind of went bad at about the same time that uh, uh, he decided to quit his business and move to the South Pacific. Um, and there's a number of... Uh, things about that too, kind of his reflections on uh, the lack of the whimsical nature or, uh, you know, uh, really enjoying life, uh, the simple things in life in New York, whereas New York is very much about like restaurants and power and climbing up the pay scale and, you know, marketing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but to the book itself. So, uh, he kind of doesn't really have a plan. Um, he's got a little bit of money in the bank from this business. Uh, and from selling, uh, oh, I, uh, from, he has an apartment, he has a, uh, apartment in New York. Uh, I think a, maybe a, maybe a rent controlled apartment that he leases, uh, subleases out and pretty sweet gig. He's actually able to turn a profit on that. And although it's not a lot of money, uh, for what you need in the South Pacific, it really stretches and is able to cover uh, a lot of the uh, expenses that he has when he's there. So he decides to, I think that he almost throws a dart at a map or something, uh, and decides to go to uh, the Federated States of uh, Micronesia, uh, specifically the island of Yap, uh, which is known for its big stone currency, for being a U.S. protectorate, uh, for a long period of time, um, and also for uh, not being like paradise at all, in the sense that um, it's kind of a slow pace to life, which is different than what he was looking for in New York, uh, but the island uh, is very hot and dry, not like desert, but just kind of like scrubby, um, and also has no beaches, uh, it's mostly mangrove swamps around the island. Uh, and in terms of work, uh, it just is sort of uh, languid and who's ever kind of attached into what's already there. Um, you get the sense that a lot of people, a lot of expatriates that are there 
and this is really true all over the South Pacific, but uh, particularly in Yap, um, a lot of them are kind of at the end of their rope, uh, kind of, you know, loose change that's fallen into the South Pacific for one reason or another. Um, so, uh, not a lot really to add there. I think he talks kind of about some of the town and there's just really not a lot going on. Uh, so he decides to uh, take a uh, ferry um, to some of the other islands, uh, some of the more remote islands uh, in the Federated States of Micronesia. And the thing is, is the ferry, he's, he's kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like speed dating because the ferry stops, it's like a slow ferry, but it stops at these various points and you get maybe, I think it's like 45 minutes or an hour uh, before the ferry leaves for the next stop. And this is not a regular ferry, it's a ferry that comes around once a month, once every two months, once every six months, I forget what's said in the book, but it's super uh, infrequent. So it's almost like speed dating that he has to make a quick assessment of which island he wants to stop off at uh, and then exit. Um, he goes through a couple of them, uh, but doesn't get the chance. Oh, it also mentions that uh, there was another island in the Federated States of Micronesia that he took a plane flight to, but the looked parad paradisical. I can't even say it. But uh, the runway was actually flooded, and the plane had to, uh, you know, from the airplane he could see that it looked like that. But he had the pl uh, airplane actually had to take back off and fly back to uh, Yap. Uh, man, this light's really kind of messed up. Um, but, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, okay, so where was I? Yeah, and so he's, uh, did the plane flight thing, and they went on the ferry, um, and the island that he decides to eventually stop at, now something about this ferry is that it does, like, a, a loot, or, uh, like, down and back trip. So even though I said that it only comes around every few months, uh, there's one island that you get to stay on for a couple of weeks, and then the same ferry, when it comes back, you can either choose to stay for the long term or eventually go back. So the island he does that on is uh, kind of funnel, fun funnily, uh, is the island of Pig, um, where he sees kind of these, uh, it's a very basic, primitive island. Uh, the people largely have what they need, but they're really... Uh, disconnected from modern society. Um, there's no like internet or uh, connection to the outside world, you know, no newspapers. Uh, and actually on the island they request, uh, I think he has like an old Time magazine or something on him and they see this as like, it's, you know, a month old. And they see this as like super valuable as like this holy connection to the outside world, this Time magazine. Um, so he goes and uh, they have like this long, uh, log house that they all sit in uh, and they discuss uh, and uh, he really is kind of conflicted but eventually decides to get back on the boat and go to Yap. He likes the island but it's just too too remote. So so far you have sort of a hot and cold situation. You have an island that's not at all paradise but kind of has at least some connection in Yap to the modern world uh, and then you have Pig which is so remote that you know you just can't do any uh, uh, you know, if you're really looking to get off the grid, it would be a great spot. But uh, as much as Alex wanted to get away from the modern world, he had to, wanted to have some strain of connection to it. Uh, and not just like the internet and stuff like that, but even like modern conveniences, like, you know, having a toilet you can sit on or things like that. <laughs> um, so he eventually decides to leave uh, the Federated States of Micronesia. And that's really only kind of the very first part of the book. Uh, the next part, he goes up to Guam and uh, uh, Tin, Tinian uh, in the northern Marina Islands. Uh, in Guam, he sees that uh, it's essentially like the worst of Americana, like blown way out of proportion. Um, there are a lot of really nice beaches. There is a connection to the modern world. There are jobs, which uh, like, you know, you can just pass your day with an interesting job um, that you wouldn't get like in Yap. Uh, so in all those ways, it would be a great place uh, you would think to live. But what really drives him nuts is that uh, 
pretty much outside the military bases, the entire island has turned into a giant American strip mall. Uh, Guam still being controlled by the United States, whereas some of these other territories um, are now independent. But just the buildup of kind of, uh, you know, Burger King, McDonald's, Walmart, you know, kind of uh, eyesore, uh, providing people probably with a higher quality of life, but not exactly getting away, getting away from it all. So he decides to not do that. He goes up next up to the island of Tinian. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which I think has uh, some things he likes. But what he finds really weird is the casino there. Uh, the casino being essentially a giant money dump, uh, construction money dump for um, the People's, uh, People's Republican Army of China which is strange considering the Northern Marina Islands is still U.S. territory, but I guess there was enough of a disconnect there that uh, they were able to build that casino, or maybe they use like a subsidiary to build it, but the money comes from the um, uh, Chinese Liberation Army. Um, and so what happens is, is in this casino, it's almost completely empty. It's almost like, um, you know, like some of those palaces in Rome or something that somebody just completely mothballed and, uh, uh, you know, it's completely vacant, except it's a casino. So it has like uh, slot machines that aren't plugged in and huge numbers of like uh, gaming tables and, you know, really nice, um, uh, you know, like hotel uh, accommodations, hotel rooms, uh, restaurants that are not typically open. Uh, and basically, if you want to do something in this casino, um, you have to, uh, the staff, they do have a staff there, but they'll follow it around and essentially uh, either play the game or turn the machine on or serve you the food, depending on where you are. And then otherwise, it's just all out. So it's kind of this super strange experience. Um, he said that there were some other people there. I think uh, mostly uh, uh, Chinese that were able to get off the mainland or maybe like people from Hong Kong. Um, but again, just like super desolate and basically just like a big money dump project for the PLA. Oh, something else that I forgot to mention, uh, about, uh, true East Asia is that on Guam, he visited, uh, a military base or mil no, no, it wasn't a military base. Uh, it was a privately owned, uh, piece of property that was actually quite large, like a compound that actually had like forests and stuff. So it wasn't like Americana, which you'd think would be nice, but what it turned out to be is actually a Seventh-day Adventist um, radio transmission station that had four towers that were all like 40 stories high or something like that. It transmitted radio waves um, in different East Asian languages to long distance, so they were like super powerful because you know they need to get across the, the South China Sea and all that area. Um, to China, to Japan, to Vietnam, uh, and essentially uh, was a big project that the Seventh-day Adventist church, or maybe it was the Mormons, I forget, uh, to try to convince people to uh, come to him. So uh, as much as, uh, you know, communist China wants to eliminate religion, I guess the people, the people are getting a form of religion if they have radio receivers, which is, I don't know, just, it was a very strange experience. And he said that the, the person there um, very much believed in the religion that he was doing, but he had no idea what they were, you know, spewing out. Uh, these were just transmission towers. All the recordings were uh, sent in um, from the United States and then just transmitted off these towers because Guam is quite a bit closer to China and was within radio broadcasting distance. So eventually he moves to uh, where the majority of the book takes place. And that is the Palau Islands. And this book review is probably gonna run a little long because uh, there was quite a bit that happened here. Um, so he goes to uh, Karor, which I think reminded him a little bit of Yap, but had a little bit better beaches and although it had the similar vibe of like washed up expatriates on the island, I think it was a little um, uh, a little more dynamic. Maybe the 
expats were a little less uh, uh, nuts, if you will. Um, but something else he liked about the Palau Islands is that even if he couldn't uh, get off, or even if core was maybe a little too developed for him in certain spots, um, the uh, Palau, unlike most Pacific uh, island nations that are very kind of spread out over long distances of ocean, is actually an island na or a nation made of multiple islands, but the islands are like really kind of uh, close together, like you know, a ferry, like a you know, thirty to forty-five minute ferry ride uh, from you know one island to the other, uh, or even like more, you know, from one end to the other almost. Um, let's see. He talks about again, Palau was an ex uh, United States uh, territory. So there's a lot of influence there. Um, one thing they talked about was the huge amounts of kind of money that went into Palau uh, from the United States government. I think that it's starting to change a little bit, but for a long time, Palau was uh, essentially like a welfare state of the United States. Um, they had their own economy, but it was hugely boosted by uh, the money that came in uh, either from the government um, in order to uh, I don't know if it's military bases or just be their friend and ally or what exactly it all is, but money coming in from the U.S. government. Plus, you also had quite a bit of money coming in from um, uh, Native Plowans that had moved overseas and then were sending remitt remittances uh, back to, uh, you know, what was going on there. So some of the things to, that he saw in Plow, uh, I'll do that before I go into some of the details about uh, ways to live life. Um... He talked about uh, Baba, no, Babel Dabo, Dabo. I'm sure I am butchering that to all high heaven. Uh, but this is the large island that is largely uninhabited, uh, pretty much just right across the bay from uh, Karor, um, that the United States sees as a development project, but uh, either through trying to create a new national capital on the middle of this island, this island probably takes up 70% of the territory uh, of Palau, but um, just because traditional villages are not there or what there are are not like the center of Palau culture, uh, it just didn't develop as a, as a highly developed area. Um, so he sees the capital, sees uh, kind of these boondoggle roads uh, that were all built up, uh, does a trek, and uh, outside of the fact that it's kind of interesting in how tropical and lush it is, um, he gets kind of, you know, he actually hikes from one end of the island to the other and uh, just gets completely overwhelmed by, you know, the, the hike, if you will. Um, Let's see, what else? He goes to the Rock Islands, which are these super kind of like weird islands that look like uh, mushrooms um, that like, uh, because of the way erosion works, they kind of go up like this and then have a dome top and then go down. So that's very beautiful. Uh, he goes to a beach there. Uh, but the majority of his time until he eventually moves is spent in Karor. Let's see, I'm having a little bit of trouble remembering all the details. Largely, he talked about kind of life there. Um, yeah, see, there's the jungle chapter. Uh, road through the jungle, road through the jungle. Uh, yeah, he goes canoeing in the uh, Gulf quite a bit. It really is kind of, he knew that this was going to be the territory that he wanted to live in, but he was just kind of sick of the capital, Karor. Um, swimming with the dolphins is something that he does. Um, but uh, kind of what he eventually finds to do is, uh, what does he do in the city? He does some job. I'm going to take a little drink of water. Okay. Um, I think he does like some construction or stuff. Oh yeah. Let's look at some pictures while I kind of stall a little bit. It's kind of a cool fish. Um, Oh, he meets the Palau and President. I'm glad I saw this picture. The Palau and President they did have a secretary, um, but pretty much what it was was uh, like you'd see in like an office building, like, you know, calling a small company or something, where they call the secretary, 
Um, it took a little bit because the the president was kind of busy with some other affairs, but eventually they just met up on a uh, running track where there were a couple of large security guards like, you know, you might find from a security agency in New York City that were driving an SUV, you know, big uh, South Pacific type guys. And then they just talk and uh, that's it. So it's very kind of informal for uh, how much the, uh, the presidency was. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, oh, he talked about how scary, as quick as the ferry was, I mentioned the ferry earlier, how uh, scary it was because it was uh, kind of like a 30 or 40 year old boat that was kind of rickety. I mean, like a metal boat, but still like, ugh, kind of uh, dicey. Um, bikes. You know, coconuts. What else we got? Oh, we talked about, you know, um, there's a really kind of a more hate relationship with Japan because, yeah, it's kind of a hated, hated relationship with Japan um, because uh, Japan took over Palau during World War II, and there was actually a plan that they had everyone build like this big tunnel that they said was like almost the entire population of the island, which was relatively few at that point. You know, we're talking, you know, a few thousand people, maybe not everyone, or maybe what it was, was they had multiple tunnels built. But essentially the Japanese plan was to build these tunnels saying that they were for military installations, uh, but then blow the tunnels up and essentially exterminate the entire population of the island. Uh, and kind of a genocidal act, which obviously these people weren't too happy about. Uh, but before the total plan could take place, the United States uh, was able to push back the Japanese. And so uh, people in Palau and really all over Micronesia are very happy uh, that they were able to kick the uh, Japanese out of their territory. Um, let's see. Okay, so the last part of the book, um, actually I need to talk about the, the girl first. Uh, he meets this girl named Sarah. Um, I forget, how, I don't exactly met, I think it's like through a friend of a friend or something like that. Um, like at some mixer, yeah, because uh, I think their second date was like on this mixer on a big Navy boat. And of course, uh, being kind of a, a purview of, um, you know, the military, uh, the military, have, particularly the Navy, having huge presence all over the uh, Western Pacific Ocean. Um, they had a big mixer on one of these uh, giant crew uh, uh, aircraft carriers. And on the deck, they had, you know, shrimp. And, uh, you know, it's basically like your classic military party, you know, cocktails, all that kind of stuff. And it was sort of interesting because you'd have these very prim and proper Navy men who were kind of dressed down for an informal occasion, but then kind of the, uh, uh, you know, floatsome and jetsum of the uh, Pacific uh, on board at the same time. And it was kind of a, he said it was a very surreal scene uh, seeing it. But anyway, this Sarah, uh, who he, I think, eventually marries, though not in the book, um, just the girlfriend in the book. Um, she is a lawyer for the government, uh, essentially like an outside counsel because the Plowan government really, uh, you know, needs to negotiate stuff just like any government. Uh, and so they meet and um, kind of start a courtship. And she seems like really cool and he's really cool. And they're both kind of informal, you know, jokey, uh, not too serious, start of relationship type stuff. Um Let's see. Uh, but the two of them eventually decide to move to uh, Angkor, which is the most southerly island of Palau and is not actually within the lagoon uh, that may, the majority of the islands are in. This is a very large lagoon, but, you know, I mentioned some of the islands earlier. Um, this one is maybe, uh, I don't know, like an hour by, boat ride outside of the lagoon. Uh, which gives it kind of an even more isolated feel, but still not so isolated that Westerners don't live there, that it doesn't have, if sometimes, spotty internet connection, uh, that you can't build a house there, that you can't get modern supplies. 
Uh, though he, actually he buys most of the supplies in uh, Kroor and then ships them out there, but it's still close enough that you can do something like that. Um, and they kind of talk about the politics of uh, uh, being able to build a house there. They have to go through the local island council um, and all that stuff. And uh, hilarity ensues. Um, they get a monkey. Uh, they uh, have some friends uh, come out on like a shorter term type of vacation. Or longer term or shorter term, but definitely shorter than one as long as they're there. Because obviously Alex is there for a long time. Um, and they build this sort of uh, house that's um, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, like a four-room house uh, that has a big deck uh, and is pretty minimal, but sits against uh, the ocean and on one side has like a, a beach that you can walk down to and on the other side uh, has these rocky headlands that you can see the sun coming up over the uh, Pacific Ocean and is very uh, I, idyllic um, but he also mentions a lot of the as I said a lot of the hilarity that ensues in uh, are they actually going to be able to do this or uh, you know like there was a uh, they built it on rock and they actually had to uh, use pickaxes because they didn't have like modern drilling technology at least uh, advanced enough to be able to deal with this so they used pickaxes and essentially put the pylons um, of this property uh, down in with pickaxes uh, and then built the property one story property on top of that so um, eventually they decide to move out which I thought was kind of a little bit of a disappointing end but I guess with um, they used the house at least for a few years that they were able to come back as sort of a second home, as sort of a getaway. You know, plane tickets are expensive, but somehow they were able to use it as a second home. Um, but he eventually moves off the island with Sarah. Uh, and uh, I think a few years later, like, there was a typhoon that came through and destroyed the house. So it seems like it was all for naught, but I guess it's the journey rather than the end result. And uh, this has been a long review. Um, but... Uh, this is a very interesting book. It is about 400 pages, but it reads super quick in the sense that there's only seven chapters, but like each chapter has a bunch of sub chapters. Um, so each sub chapter is like two or three pages, maybe five pages, uh, super short. Uh, and so it reads almost like a punk, uh, it's not a punk book, but it reads almost sort of like these quick hits. Just a lot of quick hits that are very entertaining and you laugh a lot. So, oh uh, yeah, it's a good book. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm sure there's a lot that I missed out on. Um, yeah, it really is sort of, uh, he kind of found it, he kind of found what he was looking for. He found his paradise, uh, kind of uh, was able to reset his life, uh, was able to get rid of some of the stress, um, and was able to get a book out of it. A very good book about... Uh, uh, kind of how to find your place in the world and uh, how to get away from it all. So, Alex Shisoff, uh, Beginner's Guide to Paradise, Nine Steps to Giving Up Everything so you can move to a Pacific Island, wear a loincloth, read a hundred books. I didn't even mention the hundred books. Um, that kind of like, he weaves that throughout like individual things that are happening to him, like inspiration from everything from Robinson Crusoe to Dois Joyevsky and all sorts of stuff. Um, Wear a loincloth, read a hundred books, build a, a bungalow, diaper a baby monkey, and maybe, just maybe, fall in love. Uh, individual results may vary, baby monkey not included. All right, check it out, you guys. This is, a, this is a really, really good, kind of quick, fun book. So check it out and keep checking out my book reviews. All right, bye.